Let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. We thank you that if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, we could not stand. But with you there is mercy, that you have shown us an ending mercy in sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray that you would speak to us this morning as we hear your word. We thank you for what we've already heard. and Lord, we do pray together for the situation with, with Isabella. We pray for, uh, for Marta. We pray a blessing upon her life. We pray for Joanna and we pray for Isabella. And we ask you, Father God, that you would soften the heart of her father, that she might be able to come here. She might be able to come and hear about your grace and your love. Father, we all, we all know what it is. We know what it is to have stubborn hearts ourselves. We know how hard it is to, to change our minds and to be changed. But we pray that your spirit would speak into his heart and soften his heart, that he wouldn't need to be persuaded by any person, but the power of your spirit would open a way. And we pray for networks. We thank you for Anna and thank you for the team and for... For, for that vision and that concern to, to bring mercy to, to people, to bring blessing to people, to bring aid and, and relief to people in need. We, we pray that, you would, that that ministry would go from strength to strength, from blessing to blessing, from fruitfulness to fruitfulness. Mm-hmm. Father, we could commit them to you. And we pray that you would lead us as a church in, into increasing works of mercy and compassion. Grant that we might be a people who see those around us in need and our hearts are stirred and move deeply with compassion and concern and that that translates to action, Father God. Help us, we pray. Help us to do it individually and help us to do it together. Father, we remember our team in Bulgaria. We pray a blessing upon them as they come to the last days of their mission. We pray that 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 they would know in their hearts that you have spoken to them and spoken through them. We pray that they'd come back enthused and rejoicing in your goodness and faithfulness. And and we pray that there would be a blessing left behind, that the the work they have done there would be a blessing for, for, uh, for time to come, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to turn to the Bible together now. And uh, if you have a Bible with you... uh, I'm going to ask for it to go up on the screen. Thank you. So there are two readings. that I'm going to do them in, the, in reverse order. So Matthew 18 first, and then we'll come to the Beatitudes. We're having a series in the Beatitudes, and we come this morning to... Uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. But, but first we're going to read about mercy in Matthew 18. Or unmercy. And then we will read the Beatitudes together. So that is Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35 on page 985 in the Church Bible. I'm going to read from verse 21, Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore the kingdom of Heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. He, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. 
You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. And then Matthew 5, 3 to 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. One of the big films of my generation, which is a few years ago now, was Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire is the film about a sports agent played by Tom Cruise. Rennie Zellweger is the uh, the other main character. She plays Dorothy Boyd. Uh, Jerry Maguire is a sports agent who is very successful, but he finds that he really hasn't found what he's looking for in his life. And he, uh, he realizes that he's... All his working relationships are exploitative. And all his personal relationships are superficial. So he makes a new start. He, start, he makes a new start with a new style. And he, he decides that all of his uh, business relationships are going to be built on real uh, friendships. And he wants to build real relationships with his clients. And and he he marries a single mom called Dorothy Boyd, who who believed in his vision. She gave up her job, and she went and worked with him. They started this company together, but but, uh, and and they got married, and and it all went wrong. (laughs) It all went wrong, because it always goes wrong in these films, because Jerry had to grow up. (laughs) And and Jerry Jerry started to grow up. And the, the kind of key moment in the film is... He, though his marriage is, is kind of broken down, his one client has a big night on the football field, American football field. His one client has a big night and he's celebrating. He gets the, the contract he's looking for. And Jerry would be celebrating too, but he realizes that it's, it's not the same without his wife there. He wants to share that moment with his wife and so Jerry, he, 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 we see him running through the stadium and he gets in a car he, to, to, to get home to his wife. And, and, and as he gets there, there's a divorced wives support group meeting in his lounge. And he walks into his lounge and, and they're all chatting away. They don't notice him. He says, hello, hello, I'm looking for my wife. And they all turn and look at him. His wife stands up and... He starts his little speech. He says, tonight, our company had a big night. A very, very big night. But it wasn't complete because you weren't there to share it. I couldn't hear your voice. I couldn't see your smile. I miss my wife. I love you, you, complete me. (laughs) That's what he says. That's what what does she say? You had me at hello. That's right, you had me at hello. And they all lived happily ever after. (laughs) But you know, do you notice he didn't say, just say, I love you. He didn't just say, I love you. He said more than I love you. You see, if he had just said, I love you, that would have been fine. But the the writers know we want more than that. 
So he said, you complete me. Which is what Hollywood has been telling us for years. That, that we need something more than just love. We need completion. We need somebody to come and make our lives, give our lives meaning. That's what he's saying. He says, my life doesn't make sense without you to complete me. But you are here and now I am whole. You complete me. That's what Hollywood has been telling us all my life. That you find what you are really looking for in a romantic relationship. And what Jesus says in this passage is, that's the wrong place to look for it. That you don't, you do need completion. You do need somebody to make your life, to give your life meaning. To give you the sense of, yes, that's, that's what life is about. But it's not a romantic relationship. That's not where you find it. I wonder if that's why there are so many divorces these days. Because people are hoping for more from marriage than marriage can possibly deliver. Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. But what Jesus says in this passage is this is where you find it. He shows us how we find what we are really looking for. And he takes us through this series of statements which, statements which lay out where true blessedness, true completeness is found. And I've said to you through these, this series of Beatitudes that there is a sequence to them. That they have a shape and a direction. The movement is from empty to full. The key to finding true blessedness is to begin by putting your hands in the air and saying, I'm nowhere near what I ought to be. The key to finding, the first step to finding true blessedness is to say, I need a savior. That I am poor in spiritual things. That in spiritual things, I'm a beggar. I need a savior. When I think of what God is like and what I am like, then I am not just a little way short. I am a million miles away from what I should be. I need a savior. And Jesus is saying, telling us that that's the essential starting point. If you don't start in the right place, you will never get to true blessedness and completeness. You've got to start by saying, I need a savior. And of course, that's not where most people are starting. Most people are starting thinking, I need to try harder. That's what religion tells you, isn't it? Religion says that getting God's acceptance over your life is like climbing Mount Everest. It's hard, but you can do it if you commit. If you really commit and you make the right sacrifices, religion says, these are the rules, just keep the rules. Do this, 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 and this. And, and, and if you really commit, you'll get to the top. You'll make it. Jesus says that's the wrong place to start because you can never. It's not like climbing Mount Everest. It's like walking on the surface of the sun. That's something you just can't ever do. So you say, it is, this is beyond me. Unless I have a miracle, unless I have a savior, I have no hope. That's the right starting point, and most people aren't starting there. Jesus says, first thing you've got to do is start in the right place. See, Jesus says this. He says, human beings are, are not just a little way short of what we need to be, but we are a mile short from what we, a, a million miles short. That the, that the problem with the human heart is the human heart keeps producing the things that make us offensive to God. They keep producing things like greed and pride and arrogance and lies and self-righteousness. 
And the human heart, out of the human heart, keeps coming stuff that separates us from God. And, and that as we are, we could never be what God, the kind of people God would accept. So let me ask you a question. Are you offended yet? <laughs> are you offended yet? Because what Jesus says about us is truly offensive. Jesus says our hearts are fountains of sin and we are hopeless in ourselves and what we deserve in ourselves is condemnation. And if, and if that doesn't offend you, you're not paying attention. You know, you think about Jesus' ministry, you read the Gospels, and the people were paying attention. And some people were deeply offended. I mean, some people loved Jesus, didn't they? Some people loved him. The people who knew that what he said was true about them, they said, yeah, you're right, that's true about me. I know I'm a sinner. I, need, I know I need a savior. They loved him. But there were an awful lot of people who said, don't you tell me I need a savior. And that's one of the reasons they crucified him. They were offended. Are you offended? Are you offended yet? You see, the truth about Jesus is this. Jesus is the gift of God who begins by giving offense so that he can get us in the place we need to be. It's like this. If somebody buys you for Christmas, <laughs> if somebody buys you for Christmas a multi-pack of deodorants, That's a gift that causes offense, isn't it? Because it says you stink. <laughs> That's what it says. It says you stink. And that is what Jesus is saying. He says, guys, you stink spiritually. You've got B.O. You're offensive to God as you are. And until you get, and the people who, you know, you see, you read the Gospels, they got it. They go, that's me. Put their arms down. <laughs> they said, that's me. I stink. And I need a savior. And the people said, I don't stink. I'm a righteous person. Don't tell me I got spiritual B.O. They didn't receive it at all. Jesus, are you offended yet? Jesus comes, the first thing he says is we are unacceptable to God. All through Jesus' ministry, he's saying, spiritually speaking, we stink and he has come to make us smell nice. We are unacceptable to God and he has come to make us acceptable to God. We need a savior and he is that savior. I said the religious leaders hated it. This is what Jesus said to them. He said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, what Jesus is saying is this. He said, if you know you stink, then I have come to help you. If you know you're sick, then I have come to help you. But if you think you're well, I've got nothing for you. If you think you're a sinner, I am here to help you. If you think you're righteous, I got nothing for you. And you offended yet. Jesus said, the message of Jesus is this, that our sins are far more serious a problem than most human beings would ever dare to admit. That we all need a saviour. And that Jesus has come to be that saviour. If we recognise, unless we recognise the fact that there is no hope for us apart from Jesus, we will never receive what he came to give us. But if we do recognise, if we say, the fact about me is that I need a saviour, then Jesus says, and you are in the right place. Because that is the place you are on the right road to receive true blessedness and true happiness, true completeness. Because I have come to be the saviour you need. 
Our sins separate us from God. But in his mercy, God has provided everything necessary to make us perfectly, spotlessly clean and acceptable. So the first Beatitudes are about the problem. So you can see this. The first one says, I'm poor in spirit. I stink. The second one says, I mourn. Well, of course you mourn. You mourn the fact you stink. The third one is you're meek. Well, of course you're meek. I mean, you can't stink and be arrogant. That's impossible, isn't it? That's what Jesus is saying. Is if, you know, if you know you stink, you'll be meek. All stinky people are meek. And he said, also, you'll hunger and thirst for a change. You'll want something to change. And he says, that puts you in the right position because those who are in that position are filled. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who fulfill those conditions are filled because they're the ones who come and say, I need a saviour. Jesus says, bang on you do, and I am the saviour. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to me. And then you see a change. You see, when they're filled, these people who are filled, they begin to manifest that in, they've received mercy and they show mercy. They have received purity and they become concerned about purity. They never had peace with God. They knew they weren't at peace with God, but now they've got peace with God and they want everyone to have peace with God. They want to have peace in all their relationships and they're concerned about righteousness. We're going to work our way through those, but the first one is mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. One of the consequences of being filled when you didn't deserve it is that you are concerned to show mercy to people who don't deserve it. That's one of the, the evidence that you are someone who has received mercy, who is receiving mercy, and who will receive mercy is that you show mercy. So let's go back to the story we read at the beginning. Peter asks Jesus a question about forgiveness. He says, Lord, how many times should I forgive someone and they sin against me? Seven times? Seven's a lot, isn't it? I mean, you think about it, seven's a lot. Peter probably thought it was a lot. He probably thought it was a, you know, he was saying the right thing. Seven times? Jesus said, I tell you not seven times, but, but 77 times. In fact, the Greek's not quite clear. It could be seven times 70 times, which would be 490 times. But either way, it's more times than any rational person would think was reasonable. It just means that you, you set the, def the default value of your heart is to forgive rather than to condemn. So that if, there, if you're in a position and there is any doubt, somebody wants mercy, that, that the default position, this is what the kingdom of God is like, that the default position of your heart would be to show mercy rather than to condemn. To show mercy rather than to judge seven times. Not seven times, but 77 times. He tells a story, so on it goes. He says, um, and it's this, one of the scariest stories Jesus tells, of course. A king calls in his debts. A man owes him 10,000 bags of gold. Now, the Greek word is, well, the Greek measure is talent. It's not bags, it's talent. A talent's 30 kilos. 30 kilos, uh, 10,000 bags of 30 kilos. 300,000 kilos of gold. Now, you can buy a kilo of gold on the market today for about 30,000 pounds. So we're, we're talking about a debt of 9 billion pounds. Not an inconsiderable debt. Not an insignificant debt, I should say. It is, it is considerable. Not an insignificant debt. And then you get to verse, it says this, verse 27. This is worth just highlighting in your Bible. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. That was the king's response. He saw the guy, he said, throw him in prison. He said, uh, that was the first thing he said. He said, look, I'm a guy with a reputation to keep. I can't have people uh, welching on their debts. Sell him, sell his wife, sell his kids, sell his property, chuck him in prison. And the guy said, have mercy on me. He said, okay, yeah, he will, will. He took pity on him, he cancelled his debt, he let him go. Well, this guy then goes out and he bumps into somebody who owes him some money. And the guy, we're told, this is the amount. It's a hundred pieces of silver. 
you can buy, you go to the Royal Mint, you can buy a piece of silver, silver coin for about 15 quid. So let's say 1,500 pounds. That's a debt. Again, not an insignificant debt, but in comparison to the 9 billion pounds you've just been forgiven, it's nothing at all. And what did the guy do? He throttled him. He strangled him. He said, give me the money. And the guy said, please, just what he said. He said, please be patient with me. I will pay the debt. He says, not on your life. He has him thrown in prison. Well, the other servants saw this. And the other servants told the king. And the king was furious. He called him in and the king said this. I cancelled that debt of yours because you begged me to. He said, you wicked servant. I cancel that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And here's the scary bit. Jesus said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from the heart. So that if you want to go out of your way to offend God and incur a most terrible wrath, the way to do it would be to seek to be forgiven a large debt yourself and yet refuse to forgive others relatively minor ones. To seek great mercy for yourself and yet refuse to extend lesser mercy to others. And you might say, okay, but the price of my forgiveness is not nine billion pounds. And you're right, it's not. It's more than that. Jesus said that he had come to give his life a ransom. First Peter says, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, but with the precious blood of Christ. So what Jesus is telling us, that if, if we claim that for ourselves, and yet refuse to do what is relatively trivial for others, we are showing ourselves to have hearts untouched by mercy. The point is this, that the person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, when they are filled, they're not only filled, they're changed. When a person is filled, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus gives to everyone who believes. And when the Holy, the Holy Spirit, whom the prophets promised, would come and give us a new heart, Jesus says, when a person is filled, they're not just filled, they're changed. Let me put it like this. If I tell you that we had an elephant come to stay at our house this weekend, you probably find that a hard thing to believe. But if you came to our house, and you saw a great big hole where the door used to be, and wreckage all the way through the hallway, and smashed furniture, and then you went out into the garden, you saw these great footprints and these big lumps of stuff that looked smelly, then you'd start to think they really did have an elephant to their house this weekend. Because it's impossible to have an elephant in your house without an elephant making a difference. The sheer magnitude of its being makes a difference. So let me ask you a question. Which is bigger, the Holy Spirit or an elephant? So when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, the sheer magnitude of his being makes a difference. It's impossible. Jesus says it's It's impossible, it's inevitable that when 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 a person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness is filled, it's inevitable that a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit will be changed. And they will be changed 
into a person whose heart's default value is mercy. That they will know they've received an astonishing mercy and they will be ready at every minute to extend mercy to others. It is inevitable. It is impossible to receive the Holy Spirit. It's impossible to hunger and thirst for righteousness and be filled and not do. And people who have received this have extended. People who know they have received remarkable mercy have gone on in many ways to extend remarkable mercy. We had a funeral here a couple of weeks ago for a lady called Maggie Barnett, Don Barnett's wife. Maggie had a terrible childhood. Her stepfather used to uh, beat her mom and beat Maggie. When she was 16, he tried to kill her by strangling her. And her life was saved by a neighbor. And when, years later, she became a Christian, she found it very difficult to, to forgive him what he had done. And, and for a long time, she struggled with whether she would forgive him or not. And, and then she heard the story uh, of Corrie ten Boom, which I know many of you know. Um, and, and I'm going to read it to you. I'm sure you can bear to hear it again. But it inspired Maggie and helped Maggie, and, and maybe it helped you too. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed to hear most in that bitter, bombed-out land. When we confess our sins, I said, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence collected their coats, in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forwards against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the centre of the floor, the shame of walking past this man, walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather, leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there, but since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again the hand came out, will you forgive me? And I stood there and could not. Betsy had died in that place. It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but it seemed to me hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. I knew, I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. 
And I, and still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into, the jointed ha- it sprang into our joined hands, and then his healing warmth theme- seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and former prisoner, I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. It may be inconceivable to you that a person could forgive such a thing. And yet she knew from the words of Jesus and from the experience of seeing the difference between those who would forgive and those who wouldn't forgive that she must do it. And she knew that true blessedness is ultimately incompatible with bitterness and unforgiveness. Corrie ten Boom took God at his word. She acted first and received the grace to feel it second. And through her example, Maggie Barnett was able to do it too. Now what about us? Are we people of mercy? Are we quick to show mercy and slow to condemn? When we see people in a mess because of the sinful choices they've made, do we say, they made their bed, let them lie in it? Or do we remember that when Jesus saw us lying in the bed we'd made, he came among us and gave himself for us? Is there someone you need to extend mercy to this morning? Someone who has failed you? wounded you or hurt you? Someone it would take a miracle for you to forgive? Remember, forgiveness is not a feeling. It is an act of the will. And may I urge you to remember that it took a miracle to forgive us all, but it was not a miracle that Jesus shrank from. And also, can I just ask you, is there somebody? Is there somebody maybe in this room that you need to forgive, that you need to be merciful towards? Is there somebody maybe on the ministry team, maybe in your family, maybe a colleague, maybe someone from your past, maybe someone in your present that you need to extend mercy to. Can I remind you that every time we who have received mercy reach out our hands to those in need of mercy, we show ourselves to be the people Jesus died that we should be, and we show ourselves to be in the place where he said, True blessedness is found. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word speaks to our hearts, that it speaks comfort to our hearts, that that we know that we can find mercy that we who come to you with the greatest of debts can all find mercy in the self-giving love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that comfort. We also pray, Lord, that you might speak to us about extending mercy. Help us to see how great your mercy has been to us and how, how little often is required for us to do. Soften us if we have hard hearts. 
grant your Holy Spirit to fill us and flood us again, that it would be inevitable for us to extend mercy and, and not exceptional. Father God, pour out your Spirit upon us, we ask, and bring each one of us to the place of true blessedness and true completeness in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.